And here we go. So again, welcome everyone. Um, I must, uh, I'll start by, by saying that the, uh, the uh, Federation of Community Language Schools is very, very happy to welcome uh, Professor John Hayek, or Hayek, sorry, uh, to uh, another session. And, um, and I say another session because John has, uh, has been, um, he's been to Sydney uh, to speak for the Federation um, previously. You may remember those of you that came to the, um, to the Sydney University uh, Conference all those years ago, John had a resounding success then, and uh, we expect the same uh, this evening. We know it's going to be the same this evening. Um, the New South Wales Department of Education's Community Language Schools program uh, has funded these master classes, and, uh, um, and we're grateful uh, to the uh, program. Before we actually start, um, I'll speak to, the, to, to you um, after this session. We've got some other sessions, of course, happening other master classes and, and a special course for you after um, after the um, starting in October. So I'll be speaking about those in a minute. But let's uh, I'll just introduce uh, John. Uh, so Professor John Hajek is a professor of Italian, Italian studies, and a linguist in the School of Languages and Linguistics. He completed his university education in Australia, Italy, and in uh, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Oxford, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he has held research fellowships at Oxford. Uh, where he completed his doctoral studies and at Melbourne. He's also director of the research unit for multicultural, multilingualism and cross-cultural communication and first past president of the Languages and Cultures Network for Australian Universities. Yes, I am reading this because there's so much, but it goes, the list goes on and on and on and on. John is very, very well known, um, both here and uh, uh, internationally. Um, so, without further ado, um, welcome, John. Uh, you've got the screen, I think, so yes, yes. ready to go. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, and it's a pleasure to be with you uh, again this evening. You can see that uh, I'm driving the tram. For those of you who've been to, to Melbourne, I'm driving the, the, the famous W-class tram. It's much nicer than what the alternative screen looks like, so I hope you enjoy. Uh, and so thank you very much. I'm going to share the screen. So. So wonderful to see you all uh, today. So um, when Alex uh, asked me, of course, I was very happy to um, accept. I thank, thank the NSWFCLS for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak to you again. Now, what I'm going to talk about today, it's not rocket science. Um, some of the things I'm going to say to you are you know, fairly obvious but actually the science helps in this case because I'm going to show you that if you rely on the scientific data, uh, information, it does help us to uh, give us a better understanding of how we can improve the way we things, uh, uh, do things. But I do want to apologize because, you know, some of the things uh, that I might talk about may be things that you already know or have heard, but it's always helpful to be reminded. And it's also a really good chance to uh, not only to be reminded, but also to reflect for a moment on old ways of doing things and new ways of doing things and thinking about possibilities, old and new, in terms of improving uh, our practice. So what a world we're living in, particularly me down here in Melbourne. Who would have thought at the start of this year that this is where we would be in September 2020? And all I can say is that from January to, uh, to now, the whole, the whole year has been crazy, unexpected fast, repeated, certainly in the case of uh, living in Melbourne, repeated lockdown and, and certainly transformation. Who would have thought that community language schools would be teaching uh, online uh, on a regular basis? But it also, frankly, it's also a little bit tiring. I mean, it's been a lot of work for us. Uh, you know, we're almost, we're getting towards the, the uh, end of the year, thank goodness, and I'm sure we'll all have a well-deserved break at the end. But it certainly is the case that uh, we now teach in ways most of us never thought we would do or we would need to do so. And of course, we're, we're required to teach um, in a particular manner at the moment. So the unexpected re repeated shift to online learning, I gather you've also been asked to go back to online learning as well. Uh, we started initially with very few days notice uh, and of course this is across the whole educational sector and in fact it's been a remarkable achievement really on everyone's part. It's been amazing what we've been able to do both as teachers and for many of us also as parents of students and I'm sure that those of us who have children at school and who are uh, teachers 
are able to see both sides of the classroom uh, experience and, and think about what's going on. And again, it's a great time uh, for reflection on all of our parts. That is, of course, if we had the time to reflect about these things. So where should our focus be at the moment? Or, um, well, that's a very, very good question. But actually, it's not just about now, it's also uh, in the future. And what will education be like in 2021 and beyond? And how do we achieve our future goals? Uh, and you know, there are lots and lots of questions. Uh, it's entirely possible that we may still be teaching online or at least a do a substantial component of online teaching next year. Uh, who knows? It may be that we're back um, completely at, at normal, uh, normal teaching uh, before the end of the year. Who knows? But it's certainly likely that next year um, that some of us will be teaching online as well as at school. And if that's the case, it's important that we think about uh, what's going on in both contexts and that we don't drop any threads. What works uh, now and is relevant to online is actually likely to be relevant and helpful in the physical school as well. And things that matter now, uh, obviously, and have mattered in the past, still continue to matter. They're important. In addition to all of those new things that we've had to think about this year. So what I'll be, what I'll be talking about today is, and I hope it's, it's science, I'll be talking about um, a, um, a model of learning that's called visible learning. And those of you who don't know this name, it's associated typically, uh, most typically with, with someone called John Hattie, who most recently was at the University of Melbourne. Uh, he's not the only person, there are alternative ways of uh, looking at this, uh, but it's a focus on using statistical identification of the relative impact of different factors and strategies on student learning. There are alternatives as well. If you want to go to the high impact strategies, strategies page on the Victorian Department of Education and Training site, just Google it or go to evidenceforlearning.com.au. What all of this brings immediately to mind, and I'll show you some examples uh, very soon, is that the learning environment is highly, highly complex and everything. Uh, uh, potentially counts in some way, whether positively or negatively. And so what Hattie has done is to think about, he's gone through thousands of research articles and looked at the, the effect of different factors on learning. And in the most recent version, he has looked at 252 different potential factors influencing the school learning experience. I mean, that's a huge number of factors. The important thing is that not all of them have the same weight. Uh, most of them are, are pos have some positive effect, although we have to think about uh, that as well, because not all positive is the same positive, and some actually have a negative effect. And we have to think about whether we're able to avoid those. What we also know is when he originally came out with this 10, 20 years ago, he only had about 150 factors. So in all of that time, he's added about another 100 factors. They're not uh, perfectly separate. Many of them overlap, as I'll show you. Uh, and that's, that's also helpful to know. We know that things aren't completely separate, that things interact with each other. And that's why we're going to have factors that overlap. But what what the, um, the strength of this approach is that over time, as there's more and more research uh, on education, educational practice, educational factors, we can see that the value, the relative value of a potential factor may change. The relative impact is not static. It, the more evidence may show that a specific factor is more, more important than we thought, or more ev evidence may show that it's less important than we thought. So it's fairly dynamic. But what is incredibly handy is to see all of these potential factors and their relative impact together. And I'm just going to show you what I mean when I say seeing all of these potential factors and their relative impact together. So I have downloaded, printed out, two sheets 
that you can download from the uh, Visible Learning website. And you can see uh, there are two sheets. These are 250, 200, this is a sheet here. You can see that, I hope. And so in, on one page, you can quickly work out what the relative importance is of different factors. And you can think, oh, maybe that's where I should concentrate things or not. And this one is organized in one particular way. There are, there are two um, sheets. They're organized in different way according to um, classroom, teacher. There's, this one is, uh, has a, is all about the classroom, the teacher, the teaching. This one is all about the student, the curriculum, the home and the school more generally. So have a look at those. It's quite helpful. Uh, and it saves you, the whole purpose is, it saves you an awful lot of time. So what you also need to know is that they've done statistics and these are calculated for you. And if you look at those sheets, you will see that they have um, an effect size. This is the, the, the critical so ES, effect size. And they give you some figure that may be in the negative, say for instance, negative 0 0.90. So for instance, one of the most negative factors on learning is attention deficit um, uh, disorder. For instance, that's hugely negative. So uh, that hugely disrupts the student's learning. Uh, now, what we want is to focus on those things that are the most effective. And ideally, we should find those positive things that have an effect that is greater than 0 0.4 because we, it's, uh, it has the bigger effect. What you want to be able to do is affect the biggest change for the least effort. Uh, and that's logical. You don't want to spend your time doing things that have only a tiny positive effect. You really need to focus uh, ideally on those things that have a more positive, uh, bigger effect. Although there's no issue, a lower positive value can also help. It's important that a factor that you're working on stays above zero. Ideally, you don't want to cause any harm. Okay, so what counts? And there really are no surprises. We knew a lot of it all along. So obviously, the school environment counts. The curriculum counts. The student themselves, they have a huge impact on their own learning. The classroom, the teacher, teaching practice uh, and activity. You as a teacher have an, an amazing impact on your students and on learning and obviously the home as well. And these obviously include many factors that we have no control over, such as personal issues at home. Uh, you know, that's something you don't have any control over um, and, and we have to be aware of that. We, we are able to influence a lot of things, but we're not, we're not able to influence everything. And obviously this intersection between the different factors is very, you know, there's 250 of them. They're all interacting. It's all very complex. So if we pull a string here, what effect will it have over there? So you have to think about these things uh, as well. And that's, that's very, very important. Okay, so there are many different types. Uh, there are many different types of challenges, I should, should say, and you have to recognize all of those that our students face, the social factors, the isolation, the mental factors, the economic issues, the educational issues, the cognitive and the technological issues uh, as well. All of those things obviously inter interact together as well. But we're all driven by the, de by the desire, I hope, that we want the best for our students and we want them to be able to achieve the best. Okay, and that's really, really important. We can actually address many of the challenges. Okay, we do actually have power. We have agency. We can do great things for our students uh, and also do great things for our communities and for our schools. Now, for instance, um, we've had to learn to teach online literally in a matter of hours and to rely on technology that is beyond our control. We've had to learn very, very quickly how to use Teams and Zoom and WebEx, et cetera. Uh, most of us that would never have even heard of these technologies before the COVID um, situation. And this technology obviously has had to rise, has had to learn to rise to the challenge. Okay, so I spend an incredible amount of time every day on Zoom, hours and hours and hours. 
but and you have to understand how much the situation has changed. Do people realize when uh, before COVID and since COVID, when peak uh, network use was in Australia? So people may be surprised to discover that until February, peak network use in Australia lasted for five minutes. It was Monday to Friday, and it went from exactly five o'clock to 5.05. And that was when everyone was ringing home or ringing their family, ringing their friends to let them know they were leaving work. Peak network now runs from nine o'clock to 5.30, Monday to Friday. That's a huge challenge to technology. And that's no surprise if from time to time we may have some problems. Okay, so let's think about our students at school and at home. Uh, so there's no doubt that the physical isolation of our students uh, uh, it has an impact on learning and on social networks and the relationships. They really do want to be on campus. They really do want to see their friends. And you may be surprised, despite everything they say about us, they actually also would really like to see us. And we all, actually, if you ask your children, I'm sure you'll find the same thing. My youngest child is 24, learning at university, and he really, really misses going on campus. Uh, and, you know, talking to other parents with younger children, it's exactly the same thing. It's not just about the time inside the classroom. It's about everything that goes around getting to the classroom, before class, after class, the interactions with, um, with people outside of the, the small restricted families. So ironically, technology can uh, help alleviate some of this as well. It allows us to engage with students in fam and families in new and different ways. And it provides us with new opportunities for engagement and learning. Uh, somewhat ironically, I actually find, for instance, to give you a very simple example, uh, using Zoom, I'm now better able to work with multiple colleagues on the same document and to show everybody we're able to talk about things. Uh, it's actually much better, I find, being able to share a document on Zoom than it is for me to send someone an email and, and then hope that everyone is looking at the same, uh, same part of the text at the same time. So what we do know from the visible learning side is that technology generally has a moderately positive impact. And here are some figures for you. So it has a, an effect size. So this is a positive effect of 0 0.3, 0 0.43 when working with primary students. The effect is a little bit less when you're working with secondary students, about 0 0.3. It's okay. Uh, ideally, you'd like it to be to save time, you'd like it to be on uh, 0 0.4. Uh, Joy, I'll, I'll answer any questions at the end of the, the session if that's okay. Uh, information technology has an effect of about 0 0.47. And the people who most benefit from it are students with learning needs. But you can see that, and all of these things, you know, ICT is not separate in itself. It interacts with primary students, secondary students, students with learning, uh, learning needs. But the message that I want to give people is actually if you use technology uh, in the right way, uh, it's good news. Online learning can work. And I was talking to a, a colleague of mine who teaches um, uh, what I think you call it kindergarten community language school in German. And she says, actually, she's never engaged. She's never had such high level of engagement with the children and in particular with the parents of the children who, you know, who have to supervise the children. So, and that's an unexpected finding on her part. She thought that actually they would drop out. Uh, but in fact, she's had higher attendance than she normally has um, in, in the classroom. And obviously, ironically, one of the benefits are, are the children not getting sick. Uh, they're able to, to learn from home. So ironic, you know, there are some ironic benefits, that unexpected benefits. Okay, so another thing that I think that we really need to think about is, um, and this is probably not so important in New South Wales, where there is more freedom to move around, but in Victoria, this has been, um, this is still a, in, uh, an important issue is that uh, community language schools, language learning is really good for supporting well-being. And remember, I said that there are a number of challenges. There's the emotional, the mental, and the social challenges. 
And languages really are well placed uh, to do this. And there are good reasons why this is the case, so, perhaps more indirectly, but very powerfully. Okay, so for instance, give you some ideas. We know that lack of sleep, and this has been reported for a long, 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 long time. We've known this for decades, that uh, inadequate sleep is a bit, has a huge impact on children's learning. And look at this, zero, uh, z minus 0 0.5, that's not a good thing. Uh, uh, what we need to make sure is that we tell our families that their children get enough sleep. And so one way of doing that is to introduce into your learning, in, is to introduce lullabies, songs, songs that we sing to children to send them to sleep. This is a great way actually to engage your families as, as well. Get, use this as a learning activity. Uh, there's lots of lullabies in people's languages. In Italian, they're called ninne nanne, um, and they're very easy, very easy to integrate into the learning. Another good one is exercise and uh, re uh, relaxation. This has a, this has a moderately positive ex um, effect. And this is something that you can do, uh, you, you may laugh, but actually this particular point was the one that generated the most interest when I uh, gave this talk uh, a, few, a couple of months ago in, in Melbourne. You can do uh, yoga in your language at home or exercise routines. And this is actually a really good way of showing your children that there is more to your language than just learning it in the classroom. And you scaffold it, you provide the children with the necessary vocab, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's actually a lot of fun. The students love it. You don't do it, you don't necessarily do it every week or whatever. You can use it as a treat, a special treat or whatever, but it's actually a lot of fun. Or have a look, see if on YouTube you can find a video clip that suits in your language. If you, if you want to see how uh, popular this kind of thing is, just Google Pancho, the yoga dog. Uh, and there's a very famous video clip, I probably showed it to you a few, a few years ago, of a little chihuahua doing yoga in Italian. That's the kind of uh, uh, engagement that you're, you're liable to get if you do something like this. There are other sorts of ac activities, relaxation activities that you can do. Those regular daily routines that we do in the target language are really important. So those personal exchanges, uh, so, for instance, hi, how are you? Come stai? Sto bene? Make sure you integrate that kind of activity in, into the learning as well, if you don't already do so. Uh, it's a way of getting students to ask each other how they're doing, hopefully getting positive responses, uh, facilitating positive uh, interactions. And they can also be used to engage the whole family as, as co-learners, and I'll talk about that shortly. Remember that a strong participation and achievement orientation is important. The, all of these things allow stu students to uh, rehearse and allows them to memorize fragments of language. Now, what I want to really emphasize is this is not rote learning. This is about actually doing things, all right? And then a little bit of learning around that. And what we know is that rehearsal uh, it's not rote learning, has a really positive effect, 0 0.73. Deliberate practice, 0 0.79, and effort is 0 0.77. So you can see though these suggestions that I've made really actually have strongly positive effects. But it's not about, and I just want to emphasize this, it's not about getting them to rote memorize things. It's about them actually rehearsing, and learning and practicing and making an effort. That's how you get the biggest effect. Okay, so there are a few. Now, what can undo all the good that we do? And we have to be aware that there are a few really negative factors. Luckily for us, maybe, most of these are out of our control as teachers, and they usually typically have to do with very specific family and health factors. I mean, health is obviously an obvious one, but one, there is one big one that our students may think that we have a lot to answer for, and that's boredom. Have a look at that negative uh, impact. Zero point four, negative 0 0.49, that's a huge negative effect. 
if your students are bored with what they're doing, they're not learning. It's actually having the opposite effect. It is important to challenge and engage them. And the research shows quite clearly that students want to be engaged with their learning. They actually do want to be challenged. And uh, for instance, if you want to look at the book by Lobianco and Aliani from 2013, this was data collected in, in Victorian schools. Repeatedly, they said, please don't make it boring. Now, does this mean we have to be funny? No, actually humor just helps a little bit, 0 0.04, which is surprising because, you know, I like to use a lot of humor when I teach. What's really critical is that we have to engage but we also have to monitor the interest levels. Have we ever asked our students if they like this activity, if they're interested in doing this? We want that student engagement, that's a really positive thing. And we have to understand why they may be bored. And I can guarantee you, based on my own children's experience of going through primary school doing Italian, is that if all you do is colors and numbers, colors and numbers, the children get bored very easily and they don't learn. And that's, that's obviously a, a huge challenge. So let's think about how we might be able to engage our students. But remember also to ask them. It doesn't hurt to ask. All right, so the big one, this is one of the biggest ones. And have a look at the, um, e, the effect size value. It's 1.57. This is quite an incredible effect. It's what we call developing collective efficacy. So collective efficacy refers to a shared belief that the school staff can have a positive impact on student achievement despite all the other influences on the students lives that challenge their success and collective efficacy is evident when teachers see themselves as part of a team working for their students when educators believe in their collective ability to lead the improvement of student student outcomes higher levels of achievement result. So you want to Google Donahue 2018, and this is also a web link that has um, from the Victorian Education Department on how to develop collective efficacy. So what does it actually mean? Well, the first thing is, it's pretty, let's deconstruct it. It means that we have to work together with our colleagues and our school leadership. Okay, that's really important. We don't work in isolation. We have shared positive mission, uh, which we work to achieve. So we all understand what our role is in the school, what we're trying to do, and where we're trying to get our students uh, to. Uh, it's the importance of active leadership roles. So, you know, we're not passive in what we're doing. We're trying, we're actually trying to work together, lead our, lead our fellow teachers as well and we focus on positive outcomes for students and the school community. So that means sharing knowledge as well, it means sharing expectations, as well as sharing understanding. And you can do all of that through professional learning, etc. but you need to talk about these things together uh, in your communities and through the NSW FCLS and through the language associations, etc. as well. You are, we have to remember that we're not alone. We have many others around us who we can work with and talk to. And we have a lot of information and support available to us to achieve the best for our students. So some final notes. What can you do as teachers? Well, I always, and I've been saying this for years, it's really important to plan, okay? Planning and prediction uh, are really important. You need to think about what you're doing. I would think about what's happening in the next two hours, what's happening in the next week, what's happening in the next month, what's happening in the next year. And we need prediction. The students need to know what to expect. They need to have a clear idea of where they're going uh, and why they're, why they're doing what they're doing for. And you can see it has a hugely positive, positive effect, 0.76. But the other thing too is that you really need to evaluate and reflect on what you're doing as well. It's really important that when we, as language teachers, and I'm a language teacher as well, is that we think, we, we actually assess, am, is this being effective? Have I asked the students 
whether this is the right thing for them, whether they're interested in this. Have I asked them whether they understand why I'm doing this, etc., etc. Have I thought a moment about why I'm doing this or am I too busy and I haven't had a chance to think about what I'm doing? It's really important um, in Hajek 2018 is that the importance of thinking about best practice and it's always a journey. Remember that we're not, we're not stuck in one place, that we're moving in space and time, both in creating best practice, understanding best practice and sharing best practice. And if you want to have a little bit more information about all of this and understand how you can put this in a simple model that you can use to improve, uh, hopefully, the learning outcomes at your school, you can have a look at this, um, this uh, uh, paper that I wrote based on a, on a keynote that I gave at the AFMLTA a couple of years ago. Uh, just Google it, you'll find it, it's available freely. And also for more research resources, Google RUMAC and have a little look at, my, at the website of my research unit. And hopefully there's something there that may be of interest uh, to you. There's lots of early um, literacy materials, etc., in a range of languages that may be helpful to you, as well as information sheets, etc. And on that point, I'd just like to say thank you. All right. Thanks, John. Um, we've got, um, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. We, um, we actually um, have a system today. Uh, if you do want to have, um, um, have a, a bit of input today, um, please feel free to uh, put up your hand. Um, for example, we've got a question from Joya. Um, Joya, if uh, I can get you to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Joy. Are you able to turn it on? Ciao. I just wanted to ask um, if you or other language teachers have heard of a strategy called comprehensible input. Um, uh, this is from Crashen. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's been around for some time. Yeah. Because I've found some success with it. Um, having said that, I might use it, say, for about four weeks. And then I sort of find that students might get a little bit not so much bored but yeah it, it you've really got to um have them participating in it mm -hmm. um but i do f i have sort of looked back on the last five years and as far as um intake as far as recall as far as understanding i found it a lot um just a lot better and just more effective than, than other methods that I've used in the past. Okay, Joy, I mean, I like to just, it's very interesting what you said on for a whole, if, if I may take, so obviously you've had a chance to, you know, it works for about four weeks, then they have to take a break. So there's, there's yeah. Of, so, and remember you use, I, you know, I, I use the word boring, you know, so <laughs> we have, to, now that we know how important boring is yeah. for effective learning, that's something that we really need to monitor. Joy, did you ask your students uh, at any, uh, you know, what they thought about this? Have you asked them? I have. And yep. um, what happens is uh, a lot of them actually are very interested in uh, speaking in the role play parts. Mm -hmm. So once they, und so what I do is I might have a particular text and I might say, okay, this is our learning intention. We're going to actually understand read, learn, write, and understand the first three chapters of this text, yep. which is very exciting for them because they look at the book and they go, oh, this is primary as well, primary school. Um, and they go, oh, they sort of say to me, no, we can't do that. That's too hard, Miss D. And I'm like, no, you watch by the end of this term, you'll be able to understand at least two chapters, you know, and they do. They actually can uh, end up, I might have, say, a cardboard divided into four sections and I'll have say about three or four sentences in each section with pictures that I've drawn, which summarizes the text. And when I read it out to them, they, I've noticed like this last term, they get it. They understand it. They're quite knowledgeable about simple sentences. However, I don't know. I don't know whether that would have worked had I used the old methods, you know, previous methods. Okay, so what you're doing, it's a, just, again, just very interesting for the other teachers, you're, you're saying how they're being challenged, etc. So there's yeah. a number of things that I've talked about, uh, you know, you've mentioned spontaneously. 
So those are the kinds of things, and they do want to be challenged. If you're just doing numbers and colours, I can guarantee you, uh, they, they get bored very quickly. The, and I get bored. I get bored with exactly, that. Well, that's exactly right. The teachers have to be engaged yeah. as do the students. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. We'll Sorry. just move on. That's, that's great. Thank you, Joya. We'll just move on to... Oh, they've, uh, they've muted you. Have they? Mm, they can mute you. Oh. oh. Hello. Hi, John. Yeah, they've muted. Oh, John, you can hear me. But uh, yes, can you? Yes, can you speak up? I'm a little bit deaf. No, no. Okay, okay. I'm asking about this um, new thing in education, like uh, using the Kahoot. I mean, in community language school, and the other one is CISO. Is there okay. any uh, like uh, research has been done on their effect on students? Uh, the easiest thing, I mean, one thing to do, I don't know specifically about, uh, about I think Kahoot, I have looked at that in the past, Kahoot uh, has had a positive experience and I had a colleague who used it as well. Uh, the thing about all of these things is you, you, uh, you need to plan ahead how you might use them. Don't overuse them. And then I would certainly evaluate after a period of time to see what they work. If you Google Kahoot, just go on Google and, and Google Kahoot. Um, effectiveness for learning, you'll, fi you'll find additional information about uh, how to use that, what might work, what, what might not work. And certainly put in the key terms language learning. I'm sure I've seen stuff recently on that. Okay, thank you, Zachariah. We're going to ask, um, we've got a, uh, let's see, oh, just bear with us. We've got um, Wafa. Hello. Yes, Wafa. Hi, I just want to thank you first. You've done a, a great, um, uh, like a, an update of whatever we were doing before. And I do um, agree with you. It's excellent if we can always involve the children themselves, mm -hmm. check with them, make sure that we plan beforehand, and then we eval evaluate whatever we give to them and see how it is working with them because we don't want them to feel bored. But in the other hand, what's really good for, for our community school, which I'm talking about our, our um, Dawa community school, it's we do get the, the, the parents are involved too through Zoom. The yep. children can't do it by themselves. And that's really evaluating what we're doing because we're getting lots of feedback from the parents about how the children are um, uh, taking part of it. And you'd love to see the classes and how they dancing, doing activities, drawing. So yes, we did learn how to use Zoom and it was excellent to feel that the involvement of the parents, at least now they know what we do in class. You know, yes, that, well, that's fantastic at that feedback yes. because that's exactly the sort of feedback that I was talking about before. There are some unexpected benefits. The parents can't hide. They, know, they can't use um, the community language school as a babysitting school. Exactly right. So you exactly have the opportunity right. to e engage them. And, and actually, there's a way of engaging also with um, parents, you know, in, people in mixed marriages. For instance, if one of the parents doesn't speak your language, you can turn them into co-learners. And that's, that's a very right. simple technique. This works best probably with the younger ones. The, the, the little ones is for every week you get those, um, you get those parents to learn five, ten words. And you make sure mm -hmm. you spend a couple, of, a couple of minutes every week just get engaging them with those new words. It's surprising how effective that is. What we want is positive engagement. We know that that's it has right. a huge effect, positive impact on the way we uh, the way our schools run and the experience but i will reiterate i will reiterate what is what you said we have to plan evaluate yeah. and all the time keep ourselves in a in a loop to see how is things happening with the children and how the out, outcome is is happening with the teachers because we always have like every second week we have teachers meetings so we make sure that everything is going the right way and thanks a lot alex for the training thank you thanks wafa um, great, that's great. Thank you, thank you, Wafa. Um, if there are any more questions, feel free. Just put your hand up. Uh, this is uh, your opportunity before we uh, we move on. Um, any other questions, John? Actually, I've. If anyone's had had a chance, um, I was just going to ask you just very yes. briefly. The Rumac now, I don't know how yeah, to pronounce Rumac, it. Yep. The uh, Rumac, yep, the site. Now, I've um, I've noticed that you've got some um, some material there in in. Some, 
very specific languages and some some other European languages, and you've got some material in there that's adaptable to all languages. Now, I think that could be something that our um, that our teachers could be interested in. Do you mind just um, directing them towards the uh, that, yeah, that sure. website that's what, yeah, and, and let them know what what's available okay, to them on just, the resources. I'll right. just take. All of this stuff is free. Unfortunately, I don't make any money off it. It's a big mistake. I should have thought about this before I, before I did this. So if you just Google that keyword there, and let's, let's go, let's see what happens. So this is the, the website, and you will see, but here there are various tabs. So if we do community, So it's a little bit slow. I don't know what's going on. Oh, sorry. I've got to okay. So we have here lots of different things. So for instance, if you want to look at information on multilingualism, um, various things, we have these information brochures that are quite handy. If you want to have a look at those just on your, in your own time, then we go back. And this is the one I think that you're probably going to be the most interested in. So we have this started as a little project of mine to see how we could make uh, readers in easy to easy to read readers and you'll see that we have readers in Arabic and Polish and German, Italian, uh, uh, Telugu. Uh, these are because uh, sometimes people and here we have, for instance, uh, it's a bit slow. And here we have, uh, these are very cheap readers. They cost a total cost of $2 to make and that $2 worth for the texters. And you will see that we have a reader in black and white and color because often people say I don't have access to materials. So you can have a little, you can have a little look here. See if your language is here. There's about 40 different languages, including some languages that aren't written, but please have a look at the website uh, and see if there's any, something that might be of use to you. Okay. I can see a question from Ali. Yep. John, um, I was wondering, look, um, as you said, the kids get bored sometimes in the class, yeah. which I noticed in my school, the difficulty is with um, senior kids, especially those, you know, coming in the second generation of, of the kids. Yeah. They may not be much linked to the language what we teach. Could you give some tips how to make them in, in, to engage? Well, okay, one, one e easy thing is, I mean, and I don't know whether you've done this, is, um, to, to increase engagement, and it is a challenging environment because I went to a community language school myself as a, as a teenager, I went for a couple of years. And uh, looking back now, I realized the huge impact that it had on my life. Um, I still think about those days, even though I didn't think it, it was that, it, I didn't think it was, this, it was this as successful as it was, but I re do remember very clearly the huge differences in levels uh, amongst the, the students in the same classroom. And we certainly weren't taught by anyone with teacher training, I can assure you, but it was a, there was a lot of goodwill and enthusiasm. Again, what, one way of addressing boredom, et cetera, is actually asking the students. Now you may want, uh, there are different ways of doing that. You may want anonymous uh, feedback from the students and that may be, may be the easiest and you might get the most honest uh, information ab about it. There are ways of, and sometimes feedback is, is um, you know, is uh, negative and can't, you know, we can feel very sensitive about this. So even me, for instance, I, I, organize, I sent around a, um, a, an email to students to evaluate a course that I'm teaching with others. And I said to them, please, we value your feedback. But, uh, but please remember to be respectful about, you know, in your answers. So there are ways of engaging with, with um, the type of feedback you might get, especially when it's the uh, There are, you know, there are lots of ways of asking students, um, you know, their feedback. And I think if you had that information, it could be helpful in, in addressing the issue of boredom or appropriate activities for this particular group. Now, in some cases, they may be bored because the activity is just too hard for them. It's not necessarily because it's too easy for them, but because the activity is not an, at an appropriate level for them. But, you know, without information, it can be hard for you to establish this. And the other thing that I would do is I would ask the students for their own solutions, how they think, what they think would work, 
uh, because what's what we know is that giving students a voice, giving them agency, has a hugely positive impact on their learning and on the learning experience. If we don't ask them, we don't know. We just assume, but we, we don't really, really know. And we, we may be relying on our own experience as students. And while that's helpful in many cases, uh, it would be better to actually have information from the students themselves. Okay, thanks, uh, John. Thanks, John. Does anyone have any, any more questions? No, Ali? Right. I, just, I just said thanks to John. That's good. Thank you. Great. Okay, thanks, Ali. Okay. Um, well, in that case, if we don't have any more questions, yes, we do. We've got uh, Joya. Yes, Joya. Turn your microphone on. Joya is still muted. Unmute. Uh, Sorry, yeah. can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. I just wanted to say I, I really liked that last point you made about asking the students what they think would work. Uh, and that's also because uh, in my particular year this year, I have a year five class where I found it was quite a challenge to keep certain um, students on task. Mm -hmm. And I actually did that. I kind of, I, I was actually fed up um, and nothing with the behaviour seemed to be working until I had a chat to the principal, et cetera, et cetera. And then when I spoke to them, I had some feedback about, Miss, we'd like to use more Chromebooks because in year five and year six, they're just really into their digital interactive work. So that's what I did. I asked the staff, could I have more time or access to Chromebooks and iPads? And I found some great interactive activities. I gave them a research task. I knew some of the boys loved Ferraris and Lamborghinis. So I, I created um, like research tasks and I found they were keen. They were really keen to go that path. And I was really glad that I asked them. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I thought that that's a really um, good point to make that if you do, as Ali was saying, what are some tips? I had a really bad year five class this year. Well, not all of them, but I found it quite challenging and I had to really, and, and, and to be honest with you, I, it wasn't actually a language issue. It was, every every teacher in that particular like the music teacher and their own classroom teacher also had problems with them so it was like a general behavior yeah, yeah. Oh, thing. Was, and we know that every group of students has a different psychology and yeah. so we may have three groups and we wonder why what how these three groups doing the same things could be so different and that's yeah. just the nature of the beast and you have to adjust what you're doing accordingly yeah. accordingly and sometimes yeah. It's just a student who won't, who refuses to be managed. Yeah, you know, that's, that's right. That's and challenge. also in regards to what you were saying earlier about the COVID situation, something positive came out of it for me where I created a whole bunch of Google slides and found them quite effective where the, the students were submitting their work. And I actually included things that the kids could do with their parents. For example, I gave instructions on a fitness routine. So they had to do these fitness activities where in Italian, they had to kind of count and up, down, turn around, all this sort of stuff. And there you go. Yeah. The, 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 ex, the unexpected activities that you can do yeah. uh, just to generate different type of interest. And at the same time, you're, you're working on the well-being of, of the students and their families, which is. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So, yeah. Once again, thank you. I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Let's ask Clara first and then maybe Ali. Oh. Uh, sorry, thank you, John. Uh, I just saw your presentation that uh, regarding about I saw that about you have a book about Indonesia, South Sulawesi, by Catherine. Oh, it's a translation. So, so the book is not in Indonesian. So, when I was in Indonesia a few years ago, I bought a very cheap book, and it turned uh -huh. out it was an Indonesian translation of uh, English book. But then uh -huh. I did the translation from Indonesian into another language, and then I translated it back into English. Oh, so because you because you know uh, I'm from Wollongong. Uh, I we run Pelangi Indonesian school, so that's for Indonesian language. Mm -hmm. I just um, I'm very interested if you have something you know the material Indonesian material that written by you, if 
we can uh, we can buy from from you so no i don't have unfortunately i don't uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> i don't have any material in indonesia and secondly i made a big mistake by not charging for it that was oh, a huge mistake I, it's all because, for free. because i'm willing to buy uh, every uh, about indonesian material not just from our government because our yeah. government has already given as a free but i need something different to teach yeah, yeah. kids yeah not just from yeah. Well, you're willing. Uh, I can, I can I just, actually. Um, you can you can translate the chicken little back to secret chill yeah. if you want. So if you if oh, you email me, I I'll see. give you the English text and you can translate it. Uh, I was just gonna I was just gonna add, uh, Clara, yes. the, the the material that um, the material that John was showing before on the Rumac um, uh, resources site. You've got some that you can oh, okay. that you can use for, for all languages as well. But could I just uh, add there? Um, if uh, I don't think. Yep. Okay. How are we going for time? Um, I was just going to say that uh, just for the, anyone who might be interested, uh, the um, there are more resources that are that are coming from um, from John uh, from overseas and you you've gone mute. Sorry, sorry. There we go. And um, I was just going to say that there's uh, there are going to be some bilingual books with talking pens. Now. Um, this is something that's not new, but it's new for the community language schools. So we do have some material for uh, our community language schools, the um, the out of school, the out of our school. So if anyone's interested, just get in touch with the uh, with the federation, and uh, we'll be able to help you out with that. Now uh, we'll just take thank one last question. Thank you very much. Thank you, <laughs> and thank you for John as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ali wanted to ask a question. I think. Um, John, you said in the beginning um, that. Whenever you start the same session, we have to tell the, the children, the students about the objectives and the aim of that particular session. You said the objectives and the um, the outcome, what we expect from a session in a school, right? Well, I mean, I think that the thing is the power of prediction. Students need to know what's going on. Yep. Surprises don't usually work. So you may say at the start of the term, this is what we're going to be doing over the course of the term, and this is where we're going to arrive. As long as it's clear to them that they know what the purpose is and where they're going. I mean, that's really the critical thing. If, if a student feels like they're just going blind and they don't know what direction they're going to, I can, I can be fairly confident that they'll have a less positive experience than the student who knows what the objective is and where they're going. It's, I mean, I, we shouldn't be surprised by any of this, really, but it's helpful to be reminded. I think in your Romac, you don't have the, um, our language, I believe, Malayalam. So no, I don't have any materials in uh, Malayalam, but you're welcome to translate them if you like. Oh. Thanks, John. Thank you. Okay, I think there's a, um, a question, Zakaria. Yeah. Um... Actually, I use another device and I got into the resources, the Arabic resources uh, for my community language schools. And I've noticed something I just want to ask about it. So I, I chose the subject about vegetables and fruits. And I saw that uh, you write like the pronunciation of Arabic in English language. I mean, and not the translation, just the pronunciation. As we uh, as we say it in Arabic, but in yep. English letters, and I didn't see any translation. Is there any? Uh, I'll have to any? I'll have to have a look at that. I don't know. There was a re the, I, I'm not the translator. I yeah, no, no, no. It, it's good. Uh, it's it's right. It's right. Translation in Arabic, but they depend on just like the photo and its meaning in Arabic. They yep. didn't put a translation in English. Is that oh, no, 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 that's absolutely, no, no. So the purpose is, so look, now I, I can yeah. explain it to you. I'll show people, and there's a good reason for this. And this is why they do this. I'll share the screen and I'll, I'll, I'll this, will, this will be. Okay, so if you're writing in a script, so this yeah. is this is an ugly version. There's a whole story behind. I think Alex may give me back to come talk about these, these books. But here is the Arabic script here, and you see that it's written right to left. There is no English translation here. What we have is the transliteration into uh, Arabic of uh, whatever the text is, I can't quite remember. And the reason is, is that we have, particularly in families uh, where a parent may not, uh, family members don't know how to read Arabic, the purpose is that we can still engage with those family members, 
by 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 showing them okay this is this is how we say this in arabic in a in a script that uh, that i can understand so it's about showing people one of the problems is if you show someone a book in uh, malayalam or in telugu or in hindi or whatever someone from outside who doesn't know the language can't read has absolutely no idea so the purpose is okay if you don't we want to we want you to be part of this learning we want you to be part of this reading this is what it would look like if you wrote it with uh, 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 latin alphabet so it's a way of engaging with people with more people than is normally possible yeah okay um let's uh, let's uh, leave it there thank you uh, thank you thank you thank you Zachary. john i think uh, that's going to be uh, that's that's going to be it for uh, this evening thank you i'll go back to i'll go back to driving my tram i need the thanks. money thanks have a great trip <laughs> i need the um, money i'm just going to would i just on behalf of everybody um thanks that was uh, was very very interesting we'll be able to put this up uh, like i said online and uh, and i'm sure that if anyone's got any more um any more questions we'll direct them to your to your website okay thank you everybody enjoy freedom thanks, enjoy freedom everybody all right thanks for those of you um just stay on uh john i'll just keep going here um i just wanted to end up uh, everybody by saying that uh the next uh webinars i'll just uh, quickly show you then we'll, we'll call it a night so just bear with me we've got some we've got some new ones coming up and um What we've got is the, um, of course, we had this one here. Excuse me. We'll just move on to the next one. Uh, we've got, um, I'll just show you that um, Jeremy Harmer, who is, I'll just keep it uh, uh, as is. Um, Jeremy Harmer, who is a, uh, uh, an, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> Try that one again. I'm sorry. Just bear with me. We'll get there. Um, so Jeremy Harmer, we'll, we'll try that one again. Okay, there we are. So Jeremy Harmer is um, is going to be speaking um, on the fifteenth of uh, of October. Uh, Jeremy Harmer is uh, is a very very well known um, author of uh, ELT, so English language um, teaching books. But he's also a very 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 well known uh, speaker around around the world. So he knows a lot about language. So he's got lots of tips to share. Okay, so he'll be joining us from uh, from the UK. Now before we finish, just quickly. I just want to show you also the last thing is that, and it's a very important one. So the Federation of Community Language Schools has teamed up with the, uh, with the Multilingualism Research Center at Macquarie Uni. And as of the 12th of October, we're going to be offering uh, a course. It's a short course, it's online, but it's a short course. And you can see that um, we can, we'll, we'll be sending out this information to the community language schools. Um, and it's a beauty. We've got a, a, a range of speakers. We've got uh, some, some high profile, uh, all very high profile speakers and very experienced. Uh, some are um, uh, teachers of languages, others are actual academics. So we've got a good healthy mix, but it's going to be brought to a level that is very good for our school. So you'll see that uh, the program is starting on the 12th of October. It's an hour and a half per session and there is no cost. This is offered by the New South Wales Federation of Community Language Schools. You get an attendance of certificate, uh, a certificate of attendance uh, at the end of this. And, uh, and you can see here the, uh, the, the topic. So from the 12th to the 23rd, um, so 12th of October to the 23rd of November, it's a, uh, it's a course specifically for community languages teachers. Okay, on that note, everybody, I hope to see you again soon. And we will... Uh, no doubt to uh, catch up soon. Any, any questions, don't forget, you, know, you can always contact the Federation. And uh, on that note, I'll leave you. So thank you very much for being here. Good night. Thank, thank you, Alex. Thank Good, you. Night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.